WFSU-FM now presents a delayed broadcast of the February 14, 2017 luncheon meeting of the Economic Club of Florida. This program features an address by the 12th president of the University of Florida, Kent Fox. This program was recorded at the Florida State University Alumni Center in Tallahassee. And now to introduce the program, here's Economic Club of Florida president Marjorie Turnbull. I want to welcome you in what is our 491st in our series of distinguished speakers to the Economic Club of Florida, and we are in our 40th year. Um, upcoming programs include former U.S. Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, who will be coming on March 1st. That program will be held at the Civic Center. I urge you to get your reservations in. Uh, as soon as possible, as soon as they come up. Um, and um, unfortunately, due to what we're expecting, a larger than usual crowd, we are going to be limiting guests to one person per member at this time. Um, we have a second March program, very interesting program on the 21st with um, Gary Chartrand, who is the CEO of Acosta. Um, and that program will be back here at the Alumni Center. So please do go online and check out. We have our speakers lined up through October, and we hope that you will be here um, for each of them. I want now to recognize that past president, past chair, and Recipient of the Stan Tate Award, Lieutenant General Lawrence Snowden, was recognized by the Tallahassee Democrat as Person of the Year. He was nominated by several members of the Economic Club, and as we all know, he has such a distinguished career. And I'm so sorry he could not be with us today, but we will, we will let him know of your warm recognition. I would also like to thank our club's sustaining members who enable us to provide additional financial support to the club and bring in distinguished speakers. And if you are a sustaining member, would you please stand so that we can recognize you. Also, as you know, we have an arrangement where there are five student memberships at both Florida a &M University and Florida State University. Um, I believe the FAMU students may be tied up in class today. If you are here, please do stand. And I do believe there is a student from Florida State here today. Yes, so. in our college is a business and I urge you to introduce yourself and get to know them and allow them to get to know you. We also have some new members I'd like to recognize. Patrick Coyle, Kimber, uh, Kimberly Moore, David Mullins, and Paula Smith. Also, our beloved member, Governor Wayne Mixon, we want to recognize him and his wife, Margaret. A lot of gators in the audience today. <laughs> um, and uh, some up from Gainesville with, with uh, President Fox, Marion Hoffman, who is Associate Vice President for University Relations. She's based in Tallahassee. We see a lot of her during the session and otherwise. Jane Adams is Vice President for University Relations. And uh, Mike McKee, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Welcome to Today we are going to be trying out a new sound system. We heard some of you and loud and clearly that we were having some trouble hearing. So you know how it is with technology the first time you try it out. There, there's a genie in the system that glitches you invariably. So bear with us. I think we've got it all worked out. 
but I just wanted to warn you of the possibility. Can you hear me? Okay. Now I'd like to introduce the head table and please hold your applause until I have introduced the entire table. We have, um, I, I think the left hand part of the table is gonna fall over with presidential weight. <laughs> We have, we have Dr. Larry Robinson, who is serving as interim president at Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University, where he has had several distinguished administrative roles, including provost and VP for academic affairs over the last 20 years. He received a doctorate in nuclear chemistry from Washington University and is a, also a tenured distinguished professor in the School of Environment. From 2010 and 11, he served as Assistant Secretary for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, in Washington. Welcome, Dr. Robinson. Uh, President John Thrasher, Florida State University alumnus and former state legislator whom I had the privilege to serve with in the House, is the university's 15th president. As president, he has elevated FSU's reputation as a preeminent institution, presided over a $1 billion fundraising campaign, advanced the university's academic and research mission, championed diversity and inclusion, and welcomed the best and brightest students to Florida State University. Our president, um, our speaker, President Kent Fox, will be introduced in a moment. David Micah, whom you all know well, is our immediate past chairman of the ECF board. He has been a um, member of the club for 34 years, and I can't tell you how important he has been to the kinds of speakers we have had in this club and the direction that we have, have made over the years. He is a director of the Florida Petroleum Council. On my far right and your left, Sean Wooden. Dr. Sean Wooden currently serves as the Southern Scholarship Foundation's president, CEO. He previously directed a global network of community and technical colleges and administered a medical education program in Kenya for Indiana University. The Southern Scholarship Foundation, which we all know so well here in Tallahassee, also has nine houses in Gainesville with the University of Florida. And Bill Gunner, past chairman and current board member and a sustaining member of our club, is a chairman of the board at Rogers Gunner Vaughn Insurance and is a former U.S. representative, former state senator, former state treasurer, and insurance commissioner. And Cindy O'Connell, she's the Economic Club Treasurer, a former Secretary of the Florida Lottery, 10-year trustee of the University of Florida Board, Board of Trustees, former Chairwoman of the Florida House in Washington, D.C., and a current member of the National Alumni Board for the University of Florida. She currently serves as the inaugural director of the F Florida Prepaid College Foundation. Um, please, let's give all of our distinguished members of the program. And now, David, will you introduce our distinguished speaker? Thank you, Madam President. Um, it is uh, great to be with you all today, and uh, uh, distinguished guests, and uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, um, <laughs> you both know your colleague very, very well, um, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to, I'm honored to have the, the privilege of introducing uh, the president of my alma mater, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him, as they already know, but first, President Thrasher, I know this is a little bit like having the fox inside the teepee, uh, <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll go on from there. <laughs> so, so Kent was born on a farm in, uh, in Oklahoma in 1954, and uh, he spent much of his youth in Alaska 
prior to moving to uh, South Florida where he became a Miami Killian Cougar and graduated from high school in, uh, in South Florida. There you go, another Miamian over there, like myself. He has some uh, strong Atlantic Coast Conference connections as he's a, uh, a Duke University graduate where he received, received his Bachelor of Science degree in enge engineering. And then uh, for those of you in the crowd that believe we Gators are all in significant need of spiritual guidance, <laughs> I want you to know that, that we can uh, all appreciate that Kent received his Master's in Divinity from Trinity Evangel Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago. And uh, President Fox wasn't finished there. He went on to the University of Illinois where he received his doctorate in electrical and computing engineering and then became a professor there and uh, taught there in uh, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering um, for, uh, from 1985 to 1996. And he advanced his career moving on to Purdue University where they asked him to be the, the dean of the School of Electric, Electrical Computing and Engineering until to 2002. And then he moved a little further into the Northeast where he went to Cornell as their dean of their School of Engineering from 2002 to 2008, and recognizing his brilliance, they asked him to be the pro provost of Cornell University. And he served there uh, until we, we were able to uh, talk him into coming south back home. But you need to know that um, when he was, uh, we, throughout his academic career, he's acclaimed some big things. He's a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association of the Advancement of Science, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the Association for Computing Machinery. And he's received a, a bundle of awards and, and academic and teaching recognitions there. His, uh, his wife, wonderful wife, Linda, is not with us today. She's an art historian with multiple uh, degrees herself. They have a, a daughter, Christine, and three sons, Isaac, Eric, and the one they named after me, Micah. <laughs> uh, but I know probably at the top priority of their prodigy is their, uh, their two grandsons. And uh, I know how special that is. So um, Dr. Fox became the 12th president of the University of Florida in January of 2015. I could go on and on and on about the recognitions, the award, the credentials, the Vita. Uh, but you know, it is, uh, he's done a great job already. And uh, the, at the University of Florida, it's, uh, it is so significant to have him. And I'll just stop right there and would ask you if you would join me in offering a warm welcome to the president of the University of Florida, Ken Fox. Can you all hear me okay? I was going to use the wireless, but uh, Marjorie sounded so good that I'm going to use her microphone. Uh, it is really a privilege to be here, and Dave, thank you for that, that introduction, and thanks to the Economic Club for allowing me to uh, be with you all for an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not speaking for an hour and a half. Uh, so I, I did want to have a, a, just a couple of shout outs to a couple of people here. There are a lot of in, people here that I've gotten to know and uh, that I call friends, but I'll just mention a few. I, first off, Dave, who introduced me, is indeed a University of Florida alumnus, past president of our Alumni Association, recipient of one of our highest awards, an outstanding alumni award from our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And Dave, thank you. It's good to have uh, friends here in Seminole and Rattler, Rattler country. Um, also Marjorie. Uh, Marjorie writes Turnbull. We had the real great pleasure of presenting Marjorie with a Stephen C. O'Connell Award for Public Service this past December at the University of Florida's 2016 Fall Commencement Ceremonies. She is an incredible supporter of the University of Florida, but I think even more important, an inspiring public servant statewide and particularly here in the, state of, in, in the city of Tallahassee. 
Finally, indeed, a, a special shout out to my colleagues from the State University System, President Larry Robinson and President John Thrasher. Thank you all for being here. Now, I don't know why they're sitting at the head table. Um, <laughs> they have no role, they have no role. And this is my once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I've got 90 minutes to come. And John, this is your building. You could come sit here anytime you want. <laughs> you could come here at nighttime and sit at the head table. But um, I'm, not, I'm not bitter about it. Well, today really is a special day. And it's not only because it's warm, it's beautiful. The azaleas, azaleas excuse me, are blooming here in Tallahassee although that's, that's pretty special. But as we all know, it's February 14th, and it's Valentine's Day. So one of the things that I enjoy about this holiday is something called conversation hearts. Do you all remember these guys? Yes. Um, these are conversation hearts. They're uh, sweet candies, and I love that sound. Maybe you can't hear it so well. And what's really fun about conversation hearts is that they have these little mushy messages written on them, and they try to keep up with the times. So when I bought these and opened it up, one of them on the heart said, text me. <laughs> and, and another one, this is true, the other one in the box here says BFF. <laughs> now, if you're my age or John's age or Larry's age, BFF means what? Best friends forever. Uh, so, but I thought I'd have a little fun with you all and uh, think about what we might put on those hearts, uh, in, given that we're here in the state of Florida, or maybe things that we would actually never see on hearts here in the state of Florida. So I'm gonna bring up a little PowerPoint if you all can, can see the screen. Here we go. <laughs> You'll never see this in the state of Florida, particularly in Tallahassee or Gainesville. Gators and Seminoles forever. Uh, here, here's another one that you'll never see in the state of Florida. So hot and humid. We, we don't talk about that. And for the, uh, well, the herpetologist might like that, but this is the following one, but you probably won't see this either. <laughs> Pythons are our friends. And uh, even though our state is uh, truly a political swing state, I don't think we'll find this in my box either. Okay. And finally, I have one more, and I got, I'll have to explain this one. This one says, we love love bugs, and we're not going to see that. Now, the reason that I have that up there, not only is it Valentine's Day, but there is a myth, and I, some of you probably have heard this, that UF scientists created love bugs in their lab. <laughs> This is a well-known myth around the state of Florida, and the experiment went awry, and that's why we have love bugs all over the state. It, it may be funny, but it's not true. It is not true at all. Um, but what I do want to do is to talk about research labs, and I do want to talk about research universities. And since I'm speaking here to the Economic Club of Florida, I thought I'd begin with a, a lesson in economics. And I'll start with a question. From a market value perspective, from a market value perspective, what is our nation's largest company currently? Anyone want to guess? Google's close. Google's number two. It's actually called Apple uh, Alphabet now. It's the parent company for Google. What's number one? It's Apple. So Apple is, is number one. Their market value now, as of yesterday, I checked, is $700 billion. And that's $120 billion more than number, the number two company, which is Google's parent, Alphabet Incorporated. Now, what is Apple's primary product? Here's a hint. I've got my iPhone here. The iPhone accounts for two-thirds of Apple's sales and three-quarters of their operating profit. I've got a few more questions. Anyone want to guess when the very first iPhone was, was released? When was it? Now, some of our students on campus think that uh, the iPhone's always been around, that when God created Adam and Eve, he <laughs> then created the iPhone, or maybe Moses brought down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai on an iPhone. <laughs> It's not, it's not true. I heard you all say the date, some of you. On June 29, 
less than 10 years ago, June 29, 2007, the iPhone was indeed released. The iPhone has accounted for about a trillion dollars, a huge number, a trillion dollars in sales in little over nine years. Now, let me connect this iPhone that I have here with me with the point of my talk. And the, the focus of my talk is about the impact and the value of research universities. Our nation has about 300 research universities. These are universities that have doctoral degree programs. Florida a and is one of those, Florida State is one of those, and the University of Florida is as, as well. Who invented the iPhone? Steve Jobs is usually credited with, and he certainly is the individual that was the head of Apple when it was brought to the market. But I would argue that it was really research universities, these 300 research universities that invented the iPhone, which is the primary product of our nation's largest company. And I'm a computer engineer, and they don't let me teach anymore, so I'm gonna take 60 seconds and give you an introductory computer engineering course. Here is the iPhone on the screen, broken down into its significant components. You have the touch screen that we all know about. You have something called the central processor unit, the CPU that I'll come back and briefly mention in a moment. You have the, what are called multi-core processors, that's multiple CPUs all combined in one integrated circuit. Then random access memory, GPS that we all know about, and then the battery that, that we all know about. Every one of those components was invented by a researcher at a research university. The heart of this machine is the CPU, the central processing unit. That was invented by John Atanasoff. Mr. Atanasoff got his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Florida. And he went on to Iowa State University where he was the first inventor, then followed by some faculty members at MIT of the CPU that is at the core. But every one, every one of those components that you see up there, which the iPhone would not exist without, any one of them were, was invented by researchers at research universities. Let me now talk specifically about the state of Florida and our research universities. I have three brief points, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. My first point is that leading public research universities are necessary for our state to become a truly leading state. Late in 2014, the state of Florida passed the state of New York in population. It became, at that point, as we know, the third most populous state after Texas and top-ranked California in population. But our state still trails the state of New York, California, and Texas, and other states in economic output as measured by domestic product, gross domestic product. Florida produced about 888 billion, a big number, in economic output in 2015. But that compares to 1.4 trillion for the state of New York, 1.6 trillion for Texas, and 2.4 trillion for California. Newsweek published an interesting perspective. This is a map, I, I know you can't read all of, all of the states, but they, they compared each of the states to countries nationally, or world, excuse me, globally, uh, based upon the gross domestic product of the state compared to the country that, they, that are symbolized here. In this map, in this diagram, California is France, Texas would be Brazil, in terms of similar gross domestic products. New York would be Canada, and Florida would be Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is a significant country with a lot of, a lot of production, uh, but not at the level of those other states that I mentioned there. Now, this becomes even more dramatic when you normalize it or when you measure it per capita. And when you do that, uh, our state per capita is down at rank 40 in terms of the gross domestic product per citizen of our state. Now, as we know, we have an amazing industry around tourism. 
We have incredible industry around real estate and agriculture, and those three really drive much of our state's economy. And all of our universities, including the three up here, are engaged in those three industries, tourism, real estate, and agriculture, and helping to further expand those businesses. But our state has, for a long time, sought a fourth leg or a fifth leg to that stool. And I really firmly believe that Florida's research universities will be the necessary ingredient, ingredient for increasing our per capita gross domestic product and for, for developing those other aspects of our potential economy. You know, these results are already evident in the thriving startup communities that surround the Innovation Park here in Tallahassee, or along the Florida High Tech Corridor in Central Florida, or in Gainesville's Midtown neighborhood, which we call Innovation Square. Last year, private companies who licensed technology from the University of Florida pumped nearly $2.3 billion into our state's economy and they helped employ more than 10,000 people. And that's based on an economic impact study that we conducted this past year. As a small window into how that happens, the university opened its first technology hub in downtown Gainesville in 2011. Since then, the University Innovation Hub has nurtured dozens of startup companies that have created almost 800 jobs, and of course, the same UF faculty and student techno technical expertise and creativity that spawns off new companies also lures large existing companies to the state of Florida, such as Mindtree in Gainesville and Northrop Grumman. We're in the midst of a $17 million project to double the hub size, not using any state's funding. Half of the money is coming from the federal government and the other half is coming from some of that technology licensing revenue. And we're investing in even more uh, infrastructure to support those startup companies. Elsewhere in the US, universities' private sector connections are at the core of some of the biggest concentrations of technology, of wealth, and high-skilled jobs. And with those regions as our models, our Florida research universities are having a growing impact on our state's economy. While continuing to contribute to agriculture, to real estate, to tourism, we are indeed shaping the fourth and even the fifth leg of that economy. We can also grow our support of the state's rich and diverse culture and also help strengthen Florida's unique connections to the rest of the world. My second point is that we're well positioned as research universities to have a state transforming impact. However, the key to our success lies in our universities reaching the next level of excellence. The next level of excellence. For the University of Florida, that means competing at the level of the nation's very top public research universities. And I'm referring, for example, to those in the University of California system or places in the Midwest like the University of Michigan. Very simply, University of Florida ranks among these elite public universities in many critical measures. However, we are behind and we need major strides in others. Here's a look at the latest University of Florida national rankings in the media. There are 14 of them that we track. And we're, at the, we're in the top 10 and 10 of those 14. And then in the other four, we are ranked uh, 11th through 14th. Note that our top four highest rankings relate either to career prospects for students that graduate from the University of Florida or to our combination of excellence and affordability, which is called value. And I'm certainly proud of those rankings. But we have more to do. The competition between research universities in our state is not within the state, but it's with universities outside of our state. One indicator of our universities within the state ability to compete with those other universities is the resources that we employ for faculty and for scholarships and for investments in research and teaching. Those, those resources include endowment. They include the research funding 
that our faculty bring to the state and to our universities. They include tuition monies and they include the investment by the state. And though a lot of progress has been made in recent years with performance funding and preeminence funding, during the years of the downturn, during the Great Reception, our universities suffered a great, great loss in many, of, in many areas, including in the area of faculty. Let me give you one table that I found startling. It just appeared a, a year and a half ago. And this represents the, the sum of the tuition plus the state allocation normalized by students. So all of the funds to, these, these are for all the research universities in our, in our state, including the three that are up here on the, at the head table. And if you take the state allocation and you add that to all those tuition monies and divide it by the number of students, back at the beginning of this decade, we were at the bottom across all of the states, all 50 states. Now, as I said, a lot of progress has been made uh, in the last recent years, particularly with performance funding and preeminence funding. But we still have a ways to go to have the resources per student that we need to compete with the very, very best universities. At the University of Florida, we benchmark ourselves against a group of 34 universities, all public universities nationwide. Among those 34 universities, we rank among the very top in a handful of key measures, but in others, we're at the bottom. This is a list of those universities out, outside of the, the state. I won't read all 33 of them, plus the University of Florida. But in areas in which we're at the top, it includes economic impact. So for example, in the area of licensings of technology, so the taking the technology that's invented at a university and issuing a license to a startup or to an existing company, the University of Florida was ranked number three in the nation. Not number three in that list, but number three amongst all universities, including privates such as Stanford and MIT. And we were fourth in the number of startup companies formed. Another area in which we are at the head of this list is in the production of graduate degrees, particularly doctoral degrees. We graduated 800 doctoral students last year, which puts us six in the nation amongst all public universities. And we also have similar records in six-year and four-year graduation rates. However, we're at the middle or the lower half in other important measures. So for example, the research funding that we bring in, we're proud of the $740 million our faculty brings in. It ranks us 14th in that list, but 14th is not good enough. We should be in the top, top five or four or indeed number one. Michigan, University of Michigan, is number one at 1.4 billion in external research funding. Another example is our endowment. We're proud of the 1.6 billion dollars in endowment, but that doesn't even put us in the top 10 of those universities up there. The average of those universities of the top 10 is at three billion dollars in endowment, and University of Michigan, uh, which is not the highest endowment in that list, has an endowment of 10 billion dollars. In all of these areas, the good news is that we're making progress in all of these areas. So for example, in fundraising, this past, at the end of our last physical year, for the first time ever, we broke $400 million in new gifts and commitments from philanthropy, from friends and from foundations. And the year before, we set a record with $300 million in new gifts and commitments. All of that needed to invest in our endowment and to take care of programs that are not funded by tuition or the state. This brings me to the one measure that I feel the strongest about, and that's our student to faculty ratio. We rank 34th out of these 34 universities at the bottom, with 21 students for each professor. Top ranked Michigan has a student to faculty ratio of 12 to one. Our goal is to be among the top 10 public universities by anyone's measure. And to get to that, we need a student to faculty ratio of 16 to one. So that will allow us not just to have bragging rights, but allows our faculty to be more effective teachers. It allows them to have more time to make those discoveries for the next iPhone. It's critical for all aspects of the great research universities. Part of the reasons that the University of Florida has fallen behind our competitors is indeed during the Great Recession. 
We lost over 400 faculty members uh, to budget challenges over the past 10 years. Now we've added over 100, so we've stabilized and we're regrowing, but we have a long ways to go to add the, no the next 550, which will put us in the top 10 of our, of our competitors. We've looked at all these measures, uh, these metrics, and we come up with a timeline of where we want to be. And I've listed up there the, the metrics where we're already amongst the top 10. And the middle are ones where we need to make progress. And then the ones that are out 10 years from now, even more progress, the ones that, that I've mentioned to you all. That timeline is one that's achievable. It takes, it takes effort on the faculty part. It takes great leadership across our university with our department chairs and deans and our vice presidents. And it takes an investment by friends and alumni and by our state. But it's all, all very achievable, just as it is for the other great research universities in our state. I just have one final point, And that is, as we seek to reach this next level of excellence, we're also accelerating and doubling down our engagement with the state of Florida. I want to show you a map that I have in my office that was created uh, for my office. I know you can't see all of it, but there are 140 dots across the state of Florida outside of Gainesville. And those dots represent places where the University of Florida sign can be seen and visible. Certainly, it represents extension offices and teaching and research around agriculture, but it represents another 40 locations where there is pharmacy or where there is medicine or online education opportunities for, for students. Last week, I was in Miami for the opening of our Coral Gables office. It's not a place where we're going to be teaching courses, but it's very simply a place where we have special programs. So we have the Latzinger Center for Learning where 100,000 uh, Miami-Dade students each year take courses in algebra, algebra one and two in geometry. We also have an admissions office where families from South Florida can learn about the University of Florida. There's also a new dot in Sarasota where we just opened what we call our engineering extension office. It's an engagement with the high-tech sector of Sarasota. In addition to engagement with all aspects of the state of Florida, we also have collaborations with universities around the state. And I'll give you a couple examples with Florida A&M and also Florida State. Building on our longtime partnership with FSU in the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, our universities are in 2016 began collaborating on a $4 million USDA effort to combat citrus greening, one of the great threats to our state. UF and FSU have also begun working with Florida A&M and Emory on a $10 million federal research initiative to improve safety workers in ag for uh, workers in agriculture, fishing, and forestry. And our three institutions also have partnerships surrounding education, such as one that helps bring Florida A&M animal science majors to our veterinary science programs. These collaborations and our statewide outreach dovetail with the strategic plan that our university embraced last year. And that plan has seven overarching goals, including the following. A strengthened public engagement of the university's programs with local, national, and international communities. As all of our research universities in this state reach the next level of excellence, we're going to transform the state together, helping it to rise as a leader in commerce, and culture, and international stature. And we can be rivals on the football field or basketball arena, but we all stand united for Florida. So on that note, I wanted to wrap up with something that's a little lighthearted. And I think there's probably one person in this room that has not seen the collaboration that Professor Thrasher and I had back April 1st. This is my last chance to show this. Um, we worked hard on this. It involved the chancellor. It involved President Thrasher and others. And we announced a very special collaboration last April 1st. And it was the merger of FSU and the University of Florida. And we produced a lot of videos that, that John and I are very proud of, or maybe, ash <laughs> maybe ashamed of. But since we're soon getting to the next April 1st, I wanted to show just one of those as a way that we, in addition to all the serious things that we collaborate on, we also try to have fun uh, together.
<laughs> says, how can this possibly be a good idea? What I really like about this is that we will now have the largest research intensive university in the entire nation, uh, extreme preeminence, super preeminence. Which school is my degree going to come from? <laughs> two for one. They, they get two degrees. We keep the current degrees. And we each two degrees. Two degrees. I mean, we're both preeminent universities, so it's going to be a super preeminent degree. <laughs> How will this affect the degree I already have? Our alumni ought to be shipped retroactive degrees. So in all of yours, yeah. we'll get a UF degree to hang right next right. to their FSU diploma. Right. And by the way, we'll have to What do the faculty think of this? No. Have, have you told your faculty? I haven't told my faculty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, 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 we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is going to public. Right. But we'll see. We'll see. Faculty are very important to both of us. Yeah. We'll <laughs> <laughs> what will the new school mascot be? Does Albert ride into the stadium now, or does, does Albert just walk in like this? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure they'll love this. There's no way. There's no way. Hey, uh, is this for real? I'm just up and out and just combine both of them. What would, what would happen to college football if that happened? What's the, there's no rivalry anymore then. What is this? We all hate Miami? What? <laughs> Thank you so much, um, President Fox. And at this time, we're going to invite questions. We ask that only members um, of the club ask questions. And if you would, please wait for the mic uh, before you ask the question. And President Fox, if they should be so bold as to disregard these instructions, would you repeat the question? I will. Thank as we're getting the mic set up, what do you all think about Dr. Kubiak's wardrobe? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in Tallahassee has good taste. Really didn't notice. We're going to leave Tallahassee. It just shows you they had no standards back then. Uh, it was the first class, by the way. Uh, Dr. Fox, thank you so much for coming here, and I think it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I really appreciate the partnership with our old presidents. And I'll uh, President Thrasher and President Robinson. Really appreciate it as well. I think all the people in the factory floor there. I know you've done a really good job of showing the value of the University of Florida degree and the critical importance to the people of Florida and the taxpayers of a trajectory of increased investments. So it helps humankind, helps with uh, quality of life, extension of life, and innovations of things you so describe. But have we done a, a reasonably decent job to convince the legislature and other institutions that support these critical investments, what the cost, the negative impact, and the cost to us if we don't. And it doesn't happen next year, next week. It happens over two, three, four, five years when we're not making those kind of investments. We're not breaking through. We begin to fall, and Florida becomes less and less attractive. Please share a little bit of that. Yeah, they, you know, the, the negative effect or even the positive effect of, of not investing or, or investing in universities, uh, it, you, don't see, you don't see it immediately. Um, my guess is that very few people saw at the University of Florida the decline in faculty over the past 10 years. In fact, when I showed those numbers internally, everyone was surprised. Because you just don't fill a position here, you don't fill a position there, and then pretty soon, you're at the bottom of the list. Um, and uh, so it just has to be, in my mind, I call, I, I use two words, uh, being persistent, but also patient in the midst of all this, that we just have to, to work internally to achieve all the, the goals we have, and then we need a partnership, which, which is the, the investment part. Um, and, uh, and we really need that for our state. It's not for the universities, but we really need that for the state. Um, you know, we have, we're talking about the stratosphere of universities. There are over 4,000 colleges and universities in our nation, over 4,000. Only 300 of them, and across the whole country, 300, 
our research universities, um, and as I said, three of them are, are here. Uh, and it's those, each of these 4,000 has a role, uh, but if you want to drive the economy uh, with innovation, and you want to, to have a place where companies like Apple will be created and live and, and work and be, uh, you have to have great research universities. Chris and Fox, again, thank you so much for being here. I really find your sense of humor very refreshing, so I appreciate that. Uh, two questions, if I may. You talked a little bit about endowment, and um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that in, in your particular goals, because I heard you speak before about yeah. Michigan, and uh, when mm -hmm. you played them on the football field, it was one thing. But when we compete against them in terms of endowment, what is your goal during the time uh, that you were president of the University of Florida in terms of our endowment? Yeah, you know, I had um, a uh, an observation by, uh, by by a person that knows the University of Florida well. Just a couple of weeks ago, it was when I, it was actually a week ago when I was in Miami, and this is a person that knows the University of Florida well. Actually, has been a donor, but this person did not understand uh, why we are so focused on fundraising when we have state support. Mm -hmm. uh, the perception was that if you get funding from the state, you, you don't need philanthropy, you don't need an endowment. Uh, and uh, you, it, state support and tuition, which are the, the other two legs of that three-legged stool, in addition to the research funding, just does not support all the many wonderful things you, you, that make up a great research university. To be, sp be specific around the endowment, um, I've committed to stay there until, as president, until the endowment reaches three billion. So I may be president for a long time, <laughs> or, I may be, or maybe the stock market will just keep doubling. Um, but that, that's our goal in, in this campaign, uh, to, to double the size of the endowment. And, and then that would put us at the bottom of those top 10 publics, but in, in that range. And that's one of the things where endowments, where it's not, it's not gonna benefit, frankly, the university all that much while I'm president or the same with Larry or John. We're really investing in the future generations of people. Uh, these other universities that have much larger endowments, it's because they were doing fundraising at a significant level 50 years ago, 75 years ago. And we're all pretty new in the business. Yeah. And my second question, if you will, I know that moving into the top 10 is particularly challenging because the ones ahead of us are not going to move aside. One of the things that I think is very unique about the University of Florida is the fact that we have so many different colleges and, and the synergism uh, that is so uh, possible because of that, and, and particularly, for instance, like with the Brain Institute. So could you talk a little bit more about the variety of colleges that we have and yeah. what that allows us to do that may not be possible at other universities? Yep. Yeah. I'm making a, a, a sort of context statement. Many of the other states that were represented by those universities up there, those states are disinvesting in their universities. Our state has not been that uh, doing that. Uh, as I mentioned, the performance funding, preeminence funding, and other initiatives, our, our state is investing. So I, I firmly believe that we have the opportunity uh, to, to surpass uh, many of these universities uh, and, and others that, that the universities in our state compete with. So there is a true opportunity. The, um, at the University of Florida, one of the, the things that I, I really appreciate is indeed the fact that even though we, we have these programs around the state, all of the colleges are in one contiguous 2,000 acres. They're all co-located together. There are 16 of them. Um, so uh, it, it is a great strategic advantage in competing against the places where I used to be. Where I used to be, there are medical schools or other programs were in some other city, Indianapolis or Chicago or, or New York City. Uh, that's not the case at, at the University of Florida. And those 16 colleges really do span the, the breadth of almost any area that you'd want to study in. There are over 100 areas where you can get a, a bachelor's degree at the University of Florida, and there are 200 areas where you can get a, a doctoral degree if any of you want to, to apply for the next few years. Yes. Go Gators. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. President, you, I'm sure, are very familiar, as are most people in this room, the growing divide between rural counties in America and the urban counties. And this seems to be a, a growing trend of division. And given your rural background, yeah. heritage, your 
your your presidency now of a land grant university with a very strong cooperative outreach in, across the state of Florida. How do you see the role of a research institution or university addressing this divide, both economically, socially, health care, and the other other uh, uh, areas that you work? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I've worked at now four universities, um, and um, each one of those has been very proud of its uh, engagement with the rural communities as well as the urban communities in, in their state, each one of them being having large agriculture and veterinary medicine and the kinds of things that, that we have at the University of Florida. I, I, I believe that research universities provide two things for all residents, but particularly residents from rural communities. One is the opportunity to come and study and get a degree in an environment that they'd never find in the rural community, an environment where they are uh, connected with research faculty, they can do internships with research faculty, they can, they can uh, volunteer in the hospitals, and they, they just discover a whole new world. And then they can go back to their community and do whatever they want, to, to run the family farm, or have a shop in town, or take care of the, the uh, family business, maybe be a medical doctor in, in their town. And I think we all, you know, we're, uh, Tallahassee and Gainesville are not huge cities. They're cities, but they're not huge cities. And so I think it's a great opportunity, first off, for the undergrads. And then secondly, this economic development impact that I mentioned that our universities are creating it's not only for the urban environments, it's also for our rural environments. Um, and I, I see that directly uh, in our, for example, our extension offices uh, that are typically in, not just in every county, but in the rural parts of those counties. I, 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 I have a practice of just dropping in when I'm driving around the state without warning, um, and, uh, which, which is a lot of fun. I introduce myself. <laughs> I had, I had an extension agent just two weeks ago say that uh, his receptionist now has my picture there in case I show up. Um, so. I, was in, I was in Volusia County and I showed up and I said, um, this was uh, just a few weeks ago, I said I'm university president and you know, no president had ever been to the extension office in Volusia County. <laughs> And I said, there's a new university rule, and that the president's picture now has to be on the wall. And I, I said, could you show me where my picture is? And they, they hadn't yet learned about my humor. So, <laughs> But I, I hope that helps give you a sense of how. I just think research universities are, we do need to be engaged with the urban environment, but the rural is also really what we're about as well. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for uh, sharing the insightful comments. Uh, question. I wanted to get some of your feedback when you're talking about uh, Florida being the 40th per capita uh, in the uh, nation for uh, output and income. And then you talked about Apple and innovation, and these innovation companies tend to have the smallest number of employees relative to before. Yeah. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on the long-term future as we drive innovation, which requires less labor, and the need for more jobs per capita? Yeah, there, this is a, a great, great question, and I wish at this point I had pursued an economics degree instead of computer engineering. But <laughs> the, um, the, the, the issue, very simply, well, as, as, I'm, as you may have heard, is about, some, in some sense, automation. And, um, and not so much, I don't think, about outsourcing, but, but about uh, automation and how uh, manufacturing now is a lot of it requires fewer people, not, not more people. I, I guess I'm, I'm on the side of, I, you know, the, the years of, I had, a, I had a son that worked for many years for G General Motors, and um, you know, the years of having a, a career at General Motors where you could work in the manufacturing plant, um, that is not available to, to most people anymore. They, they require a lot fewer uh, people that are doing the, the assembly. Um, but I do believe we want our nation to be the heart of, of the products that consumers consume worldwide. And we want our nation to be the place where, where uh, not just manufacturing occurs, but also the design of those products occurs. And so it's not simply about where they're manufactured. That, I want it to be manufactured here in the US, all of these products, uh, but I also want the design to take place and the intellectual capital to, to be here. Um, 
and and I do believe that as if you if the economy grows, then the jobs will grow as well, um, and and many of those will be in the service sector as well. So I, I'm firm believer that that this is a case where the 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 uh, I don't know quite what the, the analogy is, but all the boats begin to float whenever you, you have a few industries that begin to thrive and you see more critical mass, you see more of them, and each of those represents jobs. It's not just a few wealthy uh, opportunities for the, the headquarters of the company. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll take one more question. Perfect. I'm the last one. <laughs> um, in honor, thank you, President, for being here today. Mr. President, um, in honor of Valentine's Day, maybe we can talk about the love. We all know the rivalry. <laughs> we all know the jokes. But maybe we can talk about the love between the two universities. I know it exists. I know there's inklings of this. But can you give us a couple minutes about the actual love that exists? The collaborative university? <laughs> Now, John and I have a close relationship, but I don't think it's that close. <laughs> he's, he, he told me, you know, John, you, you may think he's wearing an orange tie. It's, it's a little redder when you get up close. <laughs> and I know he has a, a dinner planned with his wife tonight. But um, so are you talking about what I, I, I think I provided. A of efforts, research efforts. Yeah. Yeah. Administrative efforts. Yeah. Maybe not a merging of the diplomas, but something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I mentioned the, uh, the the National Magnetic Lab in my brief talks. Um, John has invited President Thrasher has invited the head of the National Science Foundation, uh, who will be here. Uh, when is it, John? Early yeah, early March. Um, that's a big deal to get the head of the NSF to our state. So likely I'll, I'll be here if I can to help support that. That's an area that this is one of the big National Science Foundation centers that are located here. And we're a partner in that. Um, and that it is, um, uh, there are just lots of opportunities. And, and I mentioned, oppor I've, I've, ha I've been to several meetings in Gainesville where we've had Florida a and faculty down in Gainesville working on proposals to, for federal agencies to bring funds to our state that they actually do create jobs, uh, but they also uh, raise the stature of, of our institutions. So, so we do, we, we, I guess another way I'd look at this is, you know, I, I did a, um, a, um, a, a graph of the resources that our university gets from the state, the investments by the state over about a 15 year period. And sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, but it always tracked what the total investment was for the universities and the state university system. And what that told me is that uh, my real mission is to, to talk about what I just did, and that is the need to invest in all of these universities. And if that happens, uh, University of Florida will do well, we'll get our fair share, but the other universities will as well. And then the whole nation's view of higher ed in the state of Florida goes up, and that's what really what we need. So thank you all very much. You've been listening to a delayed broadcast of the Economic Club of Florida luncheon meeting of February 14, 2017. This program was recorded at the Florida State University Alumni Center in Tallahassee. Please join us again next time for another Economic Club of Florida luncheon meeting on WFSU-FM.